Aloha kako. This is Brent with the Hawaii Cannabis Organization. I'm here today with Holly Hall, who will be presenting at our event. Hi, Holly. Hi, Brent. Thanks for having me. Thanks. And she's going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Appalachians, uh, farming compliance with respect to sustainability. I'll let her explain that more, but I wanted to let you know that, you know, Holly is a soil and water scientist. And through her business, Compliant Farms, she provides cannabis farmers with the support they need to transition into environmentally compliant, water secure, regenerative agricultural systems. So what that means is she'll help you clean up your farm and get you sustainability oriented. And she's got 20 years of experience in the field doing this. She's worked with government agencies, nonprofits, and the private sector to basically integrate the needs of society, government, and the environment. And Holly's also supporting the establishment of cannabis farmers who implement these watershed friendly practices and reverse the negative impacts of historical natural resources, extraction practices. This is perfect for Hawaii um, because we have had some uh, stomping down on our uh, historic natural resources. Her professional goals are to redefine the dominant societal perspective of cannabis industries through participation in the development of farm management system. So her work is breaking down barriers between farmers and government agents and participation in policy development. And Holly, please correct me if I get this wrong, but she views regenerative cannabis farming techniques as the new standard which agricultural land and water use activities ought to be held. I could go on and on and on, but I'll encourage you to go to our event page, read Holly's bio, and uh, watch for her presentation on Saturday, November 7th. Uh, she'll be coming on in the morning, and uh, we are honored to have you here, Holly. Aloha, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. I'm happy to participate. Um, it seems like, California is a little bit ahead of the game in terms of allowing cannabis farmers to farm medicine and what we call recreational use cannabis uh, commercially. With that, we've had um, a lot of opportunity to bring cannabis farmers that are implementing regenerative farming practices that heal the earth um, rather than degrade the earth out into the open and lift up standards to support them and to um, create value for their crops. So I'm really happy to be able to talk about how cannabis appellations in particular are a vehicle that farmers in Hawaii may work towards to not only codify standards, their standards for growing the pot, the way they grow the cannabis, the plant, the pot. Oh, I'm sorry for the slang. Um, but also to protect the intellectual property that's in that's embedded in that and um, Hi, mom. <laughs> and, um, and to really link the quality of the cannabis that's produced to the place. So when we talk about Appalachians, we're talking about people, place, plant. And the earliest Appalachians in written record that have been identified were actually in the Bible um, when the kings and the rulers would only want their wine, their Chianti grown from specific regions because they felt that that region produced wine in methods that they were proud of and that it was it, the product was superior. As we move forward through history, we see more wine produced by Appalachians. We see cheese produced by Appalachians, tequila, tea. And what all of these Appalachians do is they define a space, a geographic space, and standards that a pro an agricultural product is produced by so that the consumer not only um, can be confident that their favorite cannabis or tequila or wine or cheese or tea is produced in a way that supports the environment, supports um, the people, 
and supports the place, but also it increases the value and it stimulates other secondary income besides just that product, like tourism, heads and beds, the sale of crafts and arts and pre prepared food in those places. And so what we see when we have vibrant Appalachians is a, and a lot of times is a resilient community because we're not just depending on one crop to provide everything. We're not just employing one sector of society, but we have a broad base of income and um, jobs. Well, if we have a cannabis Appalachian that is what we're calling terroir based here in California, meaning that that plant is grown with its roots in the ground with access to native soil, native soil microbiology. The leaves are growing under the sun, the flowering is happening under the sun, and the irrigation water is coming from on site. Then we are really narrowing the those that type of cannabis that would qualify for an appellation to a very small pool that is dependent on the place where it's grown. And so if we begin then thinking about how regenerative farming practices build soil by taking organic waste products from the area, whether that be cow manure, some parts of the islands have a lot of cow manure, whether it be just forest duff or fish waste or coconut waste, so on and on. Human manure in some circumstances may be appropriate. Um, then we are really seeing a crop that's produced in a way that um, is not dependent on chemical fertilizers, which are very flashy and that they're soluble and they can run right off through the porous lava and into our creeks and rivers. And then we're also not importing those plastics. We're not paying um, for the fossil fuel that was used to bring those chemicals, those agrochemicals to the islands. Instead, we're creating our nutrients out of um, composted organic waste that then are um, organic, not only in that they're not using um, chemicals for fertilizers, but in that they're made out of chemi uh, organic compounds. So carbon, organic matter, and that type of nutrients tends to be slower released and it does not um, pollute the environment in the way that chemical fertilizers do. So um, it's kind of exciting to think that this way of marketing our cannabis, this way of protecting our intellectual property through codifying the cannabis, the place, and the way we're growing that in an appellation and can um, not only increase the value of the product, but can also really encourage us to take care of the environment in which we're growing cannabis. Um, what we, in, to use a, a comparison that um, is, is data driven rather than maybe equally driven. We compare a lot um, Appalachians and the value, economic value to Napa. And the reason why the American Viticulture As Association, which are considered Appalachians, are different than a terroir-based Appalachian are that it's just a geographic graphic indicator. There's a line drawn on a map and if your wine is produced um, and grown in within that area, then you can call it Napa. And if there's 85% of the grapes in your wine are from Napa, then you can call your wine from Napa and label it as such. So um, it's not terroir based, but it does give us a lot of data for how Appalachians may influence um, the economics associated with the product. And in Napa, for every dollar spent on a bottle of wine, $7 is spent on other services and um, products in the area, in Napa. And so that's quite a, a grand multiplier when we're thinking about rural communities in particular that are um, looking for non-natural resource extractant or devastating um, ways of building economies. Um, we're all recovering in our rural communities from a long history of just decimating the natural resources to create um, income. And we're all wise now and knowing that that um, 
boom and bust scenario is not sustainable. So um, it's um, exciting to see that we can value the way we're growing a product and um, make money from that in a sustainable way. In addition to stimulating the economy of adjacent, adjacent services, what we see is for every the bottle of wine that's produced within an Appalachian in Napa area, the equivalent bottle of wine that's outside of the Appalachian gets $3 less a bottle. So these are averages, but they are data driven and it informs the conversation that then the work sometimes, you know, regenerative farming, when we're making our nutrients, when we're out there managing the land and knowing the land and cultivating integrated pest management systems that, that will host the beneficial insects that we need to protect our plants from um, insects that want to eat them, when we're growing food as a sustainable agricultural um, system will do, it takes more work. And, um, you know, when we're running uh, agricultural operation, whether we're producing food that we need to eat, where, and if we want to make money, then that work becomes something that we're really counting. And so to know that Appalachians do result in an increase in the value of the product is very important because we need that labor to um, to be able to pay for that labor and pay for itself. And then in that way, it creates an incentive to um, farm in a regenerative way that stores carbon in the soil, that cleans water, and that um, helps more than just the farmer. We're really benefit benefiting everybody when we store carbon in our soil and when we reduce the amount of plastics or chemicals that we're using. So, Perhaps, you know, the broad vision um, that I've arrived to through my studies in soil and water science and the adaptive management of watersheds um, might seem complicated. And um, when on Saturday, I will stick to an outline and keep it simple for my 20 minute talk and what I'm going to focus on is cannabis appellations, um, people, place, and plant, and just really how can we start to envision the formation of cannabis appellations um, by getting to know and think about what's unique about where you're farming cannabis and how you're farming cannabis and how the end product of your cannabis is unique and to tell that story because the story is so much of how we can gain that value and how we can protect those practices and market the product. So um, really, I'm just going to show some pretty pictures and um, tell you the story about how cannabis appellations can serve our rural agricultural communities and cannabis, with cannabis farming at the heart of it. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. You're and welcome. That was one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I suspect you're probably going to get some interest from our coffee farmers who are sort of embroiled in this battle for, you know, what, what exactly is Kona coffee. Um, so, yeah. so we, we, we like cannabis and we think cannabis is going to lead the way, but right now, um, we do have some perhaps model legislation that we can work on and not to, not to pull you off track, but, but that's something that, uh, I I'd like to be able to share is how that legislation is taking shape when January rolls around. How, how could some of these folks, uh, get in touch with you for, for more information before the event? Um, before I touch on that, I would like to say that uh, coffee appellations and cannabis appellations have the potential to have a synergistic power if those stakeholders, those farmers can work together to identify some of the common space that they share. And I am sure that there are places where coffee and cannabis are grown together in the same system. So really, if we work together as a society to agree on 
on some of these characteristics and place and wording that can embody an appellation, then we're going to have a stronger appellation. People are going to come for the coffee and they're going to come for the cannabis. And here in California, outside of Napa, in Humboldt County in particular, I am working um, to try to strengthen that partnership between our wine and our weed. So it's very, it's very important to work together. We don't need to each invent the wheel. Let's work together to create one big, beautiful wheel that keeps going round and round and serving us all. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. If folks want to contact me or learn more about what I do or more about the kind of information I put out into the world before the event or after the event, I would say great starting places are my webpage at www.compliantfarms.com or Instagram at compliantfarms.com. And um, you can send me a message through there and you can peruse the information that um, we we're putting out there in our in the in the small way that um, we do in our social media platform. A lot of our work is local and um, through advocacy. So sometimes that's uh, harder to find on the internet. Fantastic. And I understand you might be heading out this way next month. And so if folks get a hold of you either before, during or after the event, um, they may uh, they may be able to uh, get some of your time when you come out. Oh, my gosh, I would love that. Um, yes, depending on how the pandemic and infection rates and travel is allowed. Um, I will be making my way over to the Big Island. My mom lives in La Akea and um, over in the Pahoa area. And I would love to visit people's farms and learn about their practices and their place and um, talk with anybody about moving forward to empower the cannabis farmer and to really integrate cannabis farmers into the fabric of sustainable communities and um, as stewards of and to take the recognition as being of being stewards of the land which um, as we all know from knowing cannabis farmers a lot of cannabis farmers are working with love and respect for the land and we need to raise that up in society so that we can learn from that stewardship so definitely i would love to um visit and talk with people while i'm there Thank you so much. That's, yeah, the, the huge opportunities there. And we, we also have a five to 10,000 acre um, agricultural park that we're in a design phase with. So that might be another opportunity. We'll, we'll definitely make some connections and bring everyone together that we can. Uh, November 7th, that's for our Can Shift event. You can get more information by uh, visiting hawaiicannabis.org forward slash can shift. That's with two N's. And you can get a hold of Holly through her Instagram page or her website, compliantfarms.com. Her Insta is at compliantfarms. And I am just humbled by the breadth and depth of your knowledge on the subject, Holly. Thank you so much for for teasing us about your upcoming event and for your participation on November 7th. Mm, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and wish you a wonderful rest of your evening. And with that, thank you and aloha. Aloha. Talk to you Saturday. <laughs>